and we are live on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel where we are going to paint something summery because a lot of people are getting hit with more winter and it's just depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, here with Sarah. Hello. And um, we are going to paint a nice beachy scene with some surfboards and a little changing room. And I actually added a, 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 a I, uh, I'll show you the pattern here. This is available to download. Um, and when I transferred it, I realized I had some space left over. So on my, my uh, paper that I'm going to paint on, I sketched a little umbrella and towel and little bucket. So if you want to add that in, you can. You don't have to. It just, if you, sometimes if you, your paper's a little bigger than your pattern, you end up with a little space left over. And that just, you know, you can just add something in there to fill it up if you feel like it needs it. Um, I don't really have too much to talk about today. How about you, Sarah? Nope, nope. All right, well, we do have the March uh, selection of original artwork in the shop. So if you want to check that out, there's a link in the video description. They're all original paintings, first come, first served. And at the end of the month, we switch it out with something different. So uh, those are only available this month as they, as, you know, until somebody buys them. So if you are interested, you can go check that out. I'm going to start by wetting the sky. And I'm going to wet over the palm trees, not the trunks, but I am going to go over the, the, um, uh, the leaves right all the way down to the horizon line, which is right over here. And when you have a horizon line, it's important that you have it straight. So I, when I transferred my pattern on, it looked a little funny to me. So I measured the distance between the horizon line and the bottom of my paper. And I realized that I had about an eighth of an inch off between there and there. And that's, that's a pretty big difference. So I just grabbed a ruler, measured it and re sketched it in. So it's a good idea to check those things. Or when you frame it, you'll have to, you know, kind of, kind of uh, put it in there a little crooked so that it looks straight. But then I'll save you a little hassle. I have all the supplies that I'm using linked up in the video description. Um, I was kind of cleaning my palette when I did the sample piece last night. And um, so I was, I, I was being really stingy. I had some like little dabs of core watercolor on my palette from when I, I mean, this stuff goes such a long way. And I didn't want to wash it and get rid of it. So I was trying to like, you know, use all those little dribs and drabs of paint. So I might have some interesting mixes in my uh, my sample piece here, but we'll just, I'm going to go with a limited palette today. And once we get to the adding color, we'll go over that a little bit. If you have any questions while we're going along, type the word question in all caps and then type your question as normal. And either the moderators will uh, help you out with that or Sarah will ask it to me if you've got the moderator stumped. And I just found out that the chat is going to remain now after the live stream. So, I'll, so you, I also wanted to warn you because I know sometimes you guys have friendships in there and you may be chit-chatting about something personal. Um, chats will remain after the live stream. So... Uh, I, I wanted to make sure you guys knew that. Um, that's something I didn't even think of when I, when I found out. That's, oh, sometimes people are talking about, you know, health issues and stuff with one another. And um, I guess if there was a lot of personal chat, I couldn't remove it. That is a setting I think I have in my in my YouTube channel. But There is quite a glare on the paper right now. Oh, yeah, there probably will be because I'm wetting it. So I'm trying to see. Well, I'm t actually tipping it so I can see a glare, so I can see where I've wet it and where I haven't. So it can be really hard with all these lights to see where I've actually wet the paper. Okay. Now on my palette, I'm going to mix up some nice sky blue color, some tropical sky blue. So instead of just the ultramarine I would use if I was doing like a, a main sky, I'm going to be using phthalo blue and ultramarine. And that will give me a more um, tropical sky, but not have it too crazy blue. Now we're going to throw that in there, the darkest towards the top. That is super, super bright. And I'm actually going to spray it with my little spray bottle here and let it drip. And that can help uh, wick it down with capillary action. We'll get some really neat effects in the sky there. And I'm just kind of adding the color up in the other sky and just kind of letting it float down. If you do want clouds in your sky, you want to lift them off fairly quickly because phthalo blue is he uh, heavily staining. Ultramarine doesn't stain. That's a nice sky color, but it definitely doesn't have that vibrancy that a tropical sky has. So that's that's just a, one of the drawbacks of, of using a, a um, phthalo color. 
You're also going to want to keep an eye on your puddles. So when you're when you've got all the color in that you want, we'll want to soak those up so we don't end up with cauliflowers in our sky. Of course, they could look like funky clouds and end up looking pretty cool, but um, we have a nice bright sunny day. I don't know if we want any clouds in the sky. No clouds here. We got yes, yeah, seriously. No more clouds. No clouds. I want to have to use SPF 50 sunblock in this <laughs> in this scene, this scenario. Ah, oh, sunblock, lovely coconut smell. Sometimes I'll put sunblock on in the winter for lotion just so I can it can smell like summer. <laughs> Lift your spirits. Yep. We've had our vacation pictures uh, like on the computer desktop rotating. Um, and that's been so nice to be reminded of that trip because like how often do you, you know, pull out your scrapbooks to, I haven't even, I did a mini book of that album, but I don't, you know, I never pull it down off the shelf to look at it. Right, when it's yeah. scrolling through the computer, I see it all the time. I love it. And like grab a paper towel. Oops, I'm a little off camera there. If you want clouds, you can go ahead and lift them out. Bigger clouds at the top of your paper if you're going to do them. Smaller as you work on down. I'm going to lift a little bit um, of color out near the palm trees. Not a ton, but just so that I know I'll be able to um, uh, paint on those palm fronds and not have it competing with that blue in the sky too much. But since we're doing green, right, for palm leaves, it the sky's blue. Green is a... Uh, use blue to make green, it's not going to really be a problem. So for any puddles, um, rather than using the paper towel, because that can take too much out, I like to dry off my brush and just set it down there in the puddle and it's going to drink up that extra moisture. And that way it doesn't really leave a mark, it just kind of takes away the excess. And if you have a good brush, you can even get in there, um, even though it's a big fat brush, it will come to a really fine point so you can pull any of that extra excess paint around to around the surfboards or gaps in the fence, any any place like that, you'll be able to kind of move it around a little bit. You just want to make sure you get those puddles before they start to dry and leave funky cauliflowers in your sky. All right, and I just like to tip it around because that's how you can really see if you've got puddles or tip it on its edge and you can see the puddles kind of form because they run, the paint collects, the water collects there. And just keep doing that until you have removed any excess. And then when you lay it down flat, any, um, any remaining excess water should even out, should level off a little bit so you won't have the uh, cauliflower effect. And then we're going to start working on the sand. So uh, we've so far used ultramarine blue and thalo blue. The next color we're going to grab is Naples yellow. But if you don't have Naples yellow, because that might be a little bit more of a specialty color, uh, you can use yellow ochre and some water. And if it, if it still seems like it's hard to handle, like it's too strong, you can add a little Chinese white into it. Naples yellow is a opaque yellow that does contain some white. So you're not really cheating if you do add some Chinese white to that because that the Naples yellow contains that as well. I can even tell you, I think, oh, actually it doesn't, it doesn't list that it has white on it, but I would be very surprised if it doesn't because it's very opaque. And this is a core, uh, core Naples yellow. And I did see Amazon had a really good price on the cores this week. They had the 24 set for $69, I think, and I've never seen it below 72. Um, so, I mean, it's only a couple bucks. I wouldn't run out and buy it just because of that. But um, if you needed some and you were waiting for a deal, that's a, that's a deal. All right. So I am going to wet the, the uh, bottom part of the painting. I went with a smaller brush. I don't want to have as much water as I did in the sky because I don't really care if this blends a lot. Um, and plus, the Naples yellow is an earth tone and it's going to um, be easy to lift if I need to lift and move it later. And on the pattern, because the pattern kind of is on eight and a half by 11 paper and you probably have nine by 12, um, watercolor paper you're going on, you might have to put in the other side of your birch of the um, palm tree there. So I am wetting over on this area just because I know I'm going to have sand there. And I'm just going to 
very loosely wet the rest of the bottom. And if you want to throw in a little beachy area here, get a little pail and bucket and, a, and an umbrella that was an afterthought, if you have a gap of space, you can do that. You don't have to though, it'll be pretty either way. Or you can even go with a really simple version like the sample piece I did. It doesn't have as many things going on. All right, so we've got our Naples yellow. I'm just gonna go in and add that. One quality I really like about the core paint is that it really flows well when you add it to your paper. It has um, a different binder than other watercolors. However, it does mix with your other watercolors, so you don't have to keep it separate. Um, it can play well with all your other colors you have in your palette. Uh, but that Aquazol binder is something conservators have used for a long time. So it's, um, it's absolutely safe to use, it's just different. It's, and it's lighter than the gum Arabic, so I think that's why it helps our watercolor move so well. I don't wanna fill in everything, because I wanna be able to, I'm gonna tip this a little bit, I feel like I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of glare or, it's super yeah bright. it's like super the palette glare. is Let's... super washed out like it's just a giant glare. yeah if we do that is that too dark if you're looking when that when you're I'm getting caught up okay i'm gonna leave it like that for a second if it turns out to be too dark i'll move the lights back but i've just turned the lights off of that i think sometimes webcams will um will make things seem a lot brighter i'm going to find a burnt sienna i think Yes, let's grab a burnt sienna to go with this too. Um, I've got a little burnt sienna I'm gonna add into the Naples yellow just to darken it a little bit. And it's also got a little bit of a reddish tone. Does that look any better? Can you, are you at the- Yeah, you... it's, it, the palette has like a weird blue color to it Oh now. boy. Like, <laughs> so maybe oh. just a little more. A little more light. Yeah. Maybe I will prop the paper, painting up so it's not, glaring so much there i think that maybe with the lights like that i think that might work a little bit better um so this mixes naples yellow and burnt sienna and by adding this here and there that's just going to give us like some depth and not have everything too um too one tone yeah, yeah that's much better oh Mom, good uh, yep yeah, that's better and I'm gonna bring that uh, that darker color into my little changing hut here that's on the beach. And then I'm gonna grab a little ultramarine blue and I'm gonna mix some of that in with my burnt sienna. I have um, magnets on the bottom of my watercolor pans here. That's how I hold them into this tin. This tin is what the core watercolors come in. They come in tubes, but they're in a tin like this. And I love that the lid has a um, an area that you can use as a palette. Although I wouldn't recommend squirting out little dabs on it unless you absolutely know you wanna just kind of have it there because it takes you so long to use it up that uh, you may wish that you had that all clean and if you're like me, you'll be too stingy to wipe out the paint so you can use it for other things. They're smaller sets. You used to come like that, but they they put smaller tins for the smaller sets now. So I just want it a little darker as you go into the hut there. So I'm just kind of blending in some lighter color around the hut. And then as you go like underneath the, the curtain in the hut, it's gonna get a little darker. I also think it'd be cool to have some, a little bit of green here and there, like there might be some little grasses poking up and I've got some sap green. And I'm just gonna throw it in here and there. So there could just be little patches of, like some, a little bit of grass, how it can, it can pop in here and there. For texture, um, we can flick on some of the um, burnt sienna, and because some areas are wet and some are dry, we're going to get some uneven speckles, and that's going to work out pretty well. And I used this the other day, and it worked really well. This is a of like a it's called the scrubber, but honestly, it's too stiff to scrub paper. It just it can shred even your Archer's paper. But I found that it works really good for um, speckling. So if you have this brush, it's a Creative Mark scrubber, and you've like ruined watercolor paper, and you you know. We're about to throw it away. Don't throw it away. 
um, you can use it for this. So I grabbed the Burnt Sienna and I'm just putting it basically in that palette. It still had a little bit of the uh, mix that I used there, which was Ultramarine Blue and Burnt Sienna. And I'm just going to flick that on there. It's just going to give us a little texture. Try to keep it to the bottom of your paper though, because you wouldn't really see um, texture the further away you are, you're going to be seeing that up close only. Now I want to show you the reference photo really quick. I did link it up um, in the video description. I'm just going to bring it over here so you can see. So this is a picture that inspired me. Um, I love the way these surfboards looked and I love this little like awning here. So instead of making it like an awning with a big building behind it and a road in front of it and a sidewalk, I decided to make it a beach. Keep the keep a couple palm trees, keep the surfboards, turn this into a changing room with a curtain instead of a like a bamboo door, and um, you know, not have quite so many surfboards and put them in rainbow order. So um you can take your reference photos and change them how they'll suit you. You don't have to use things just the way they are. And when you develop some drawing skills, you can draw whatever you want. You don't have to just rely on the reference photos that you see. So um if you're not quite happy with something. You know, you like a photo, you're inspired by it, but it's just not exactly what you want. Change it up. You can sketch it on a piece of typing paper like I did here, figure out the way you want it, and then use tracing paper, I mean, a transfer paper to transfer it onto your onto your good watercolor paper so you don't have to worry about damaging it, you know, by erasing too much. Just, um, and you can be really fearless when you're working on typing paper because, you know, you don't, it's, it's just typing paper. It's only, you know, a penny a piece. You don't have to worry about it too much. We have any questions yet? Uh, we've had several, but you've kind of been chatting, so I didn't interrupt. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, do no, we have... No, you were talking about technique and stuff. Yeah, lay them um, on me. Gail AC, how do I keep my pencil marks from blurring and blending away? Um, well, sometimes your pencil marks, uh, your, your graphite will be water-soluble. So you want to try to find a pencil that does not, um, that's not water-soluble. Uh, usually your regular pencils are not, but sometimes they can smudge. Also, choosing a pencil um, at the art store, look for one that has an H or a 2H or an F. Those are hard pencils that are not going to smudge away very easily um, when you do watercolor over them. And they'll also give you a super, super light line when you are working. So they are not going to show up that much afterwards. An HB is, um, our number two pencil is equivalent to an HB, which is much smudgier and softer than like a, an F or a 2H or a 3H. The higher number H, the harder and lighter the pencil is going to be. So it's not going to want to smudge and it's not going to be very dark. Wendy Slowski, with all the different palettes and types of paint you have, how do you decide which ones to use for a painting? Um, well, you know, there's a couple, uh, sometimes I've just, I'll just hanker for a particular paint just because like, like with the, the core paint just flows, it goes, goes crazy when you hit the water to it. And that's just fun. And sometimes I'm in, in the mood for that, especially if I want bright summery colors. Um, and these, these are just so nice and bright. Uh, other times like a palette might have all the colors that I'm looking for. Like it might, I might be doing a landscape and uh, a particular palette of colors I have might all have really good colors to do that in. Um, I might want colors that granulate more. So I might go with a palette that's got more granulating colors. Or I might, um, a lot of times I try to find paints that aren't crazy expensive at the moment. So if I am um, doing a project, I can recommend something that's not going to be, not going to break the bank for people. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of different factors. I'm going to start, I've taken Indian yellow and thalo blue and mix them together to make this kind of, um, it's almost like a, a tealy green color. And I'm going to add that to my water area down here near the beach. And I'm going to have to fuss around this little umbrella a bit. I'm not wetting the paper first because it is such a small area that I really don't feel like I need to. I can work quickly enough, but if you have a larger area of water or you feel like you have difficulty blending, maybe your paper is not, um, it doesn't blend very well, you can wet this area first. Oh, I got into the tree a little bit. And I'm just going to bring that color all the way across. Then I'm going to add some more thalo blue to it. giving me more of a turquoisey color and that's going to go right above 
because this color has a, a phthalo in it, it is going to stain. So I do want to work fairly quickly here. I should probably tip this. I don't want to make it glare really bad for you, but it's going to be easier if you're tipping it so that you can um, you can have the dry area of paper underneath where you're working. It's because gravity will help keep that edge wet and it will just make it blend a little easier. But you can always paint over the entire thing if you need to, if it starts to, you know, dry too quickly for you. Keeping up with the Joneses, does watercolor behave the same on watercolor canvas as paper? I know it's quite a bit different on the watercolor canvas. Watercolor canvas, um, it doesn't flow quite as much because of the texture of it. Um, it's also got like a watercolor ground on it, which is ju it, it just, it's not as absor it's weird because it's not as absorbent and it's also not as um not as fluid so even though your your paint's not absorbing into the material it's also not like floating around that much it's i don't really care for it myself but um but some people do so i would say give it a try you be patient with it and don't expect it to be like paper because it doesn't act like paper but you know there are advantages like being able to um you know, finish it and display it more like a traditional artwork. So there's that. Now I'm going to go, I realized that I should have this a little bit lighter as it comes down towards the beach. So I'm actually going to wet my brush and wipe away a little bit of the color closer to the water. Since it's staining, I'm not going to wipe it all away, but that's fine because I need some color in there anyway. And that'll help me smooth it out a little bit too. Those phthalo colors are very strong and I got a little, got a little uh, overzealous with them. I'm gonna switch with a firmer brush so I can mix up the pigment that's on the paper a little bit better. And I'm gonna go in and add a little bit more of the uh, phthalo blue up to the top just to darken it a little bit. As you, you're looking deeper into the sea, the water's deeper, the color's going to be more intense. And I'm going to add a little bit of Naples yellow into the, um, into the bottom area of the water. Just to kind of make it look like you can kind of see the sand through the water a little bit. splashes have you tried using Karen Dosh gouache no I don't have any of that um, I am I, the gouache I do have I'm pretty happy with I have Lucas and I have Arteza um, and I have a little bit of M Graham and a little bit um, actually I don't think I have any Windsor or Newton I thought I did I know it's M Graham um, and I'm pretty happy with that so I have not tried the Karen Dosh and I think Car mostly Karen Dosh products are pretty expensive too. So I just, I don't feel like I paint and gouache that much to invest in a, another kind. All right, I'm going to stop messing with that water because I keep I'm making a more of a hard edge on the bottom as I mess with it. So I'm going to leave that be for now. And I'm going to move on to the uh, little shed over here. I'm going to make some gray and I'm going to use... Uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. If anybody has, has used the Karen Dosh and wants to chime in. We have a lot of our regulars, so somebody has probably at least tried it. I wonder if it's new, because it seems like a lot of people have asked me about that recently, or maybe, maybe it's the same person, I'm not sure, but... I wonder if it's new or if it's starting to be offered at a big box store or something. The, uh, the person asked questions that they saw at Hobby Lobby. Oh, okay. 
That's weird. I didn't know if they. I didn't think that the big box stores usually carried the Karen Dosh stuff. I'm not sure where they are from, so maybe oh, one yeah. of the bigger stores. Could be not up, not up in northern Maine. <laughs> So I'm just using this really cheap um, little flat synthetic brush to just kind of tap on some like uh, boards on this shed. This is just like a number seven flat synthetic. And I'm putting these darks in first because then when I, I can glaze over with the like kind of lighter gray that I'm gonna make the shed the, so it looks like weathered wood. And I can also use that color and paint to the inside of the uh, changing room too here. What was the question? What would you uh, have? Rosin Rose Art. I watched your stretching watercolor paper video and was wondering if you can remove the tape once the paper is dry and paint onto it or do you have to keep the tape on until you finish painting? Keep the tape on until you're finished painting and then I cut the tape off so I make sure I have plenty of, of uh, extra space so I don't have to try to soak the tape and remove it. I just cut it. Rupam Mida, anytime I try to glaze, the color underneath lifts. I'm new to watercolor. Am I doing something wrong, or could it be the quality of the paint paper? Um, yeah, it could be. It could be either. First, make sure that your. Um, I'm repeating the same technique on the fence uh, as I did on the shed. Um, first, make sure that your layer underneath that you're trying to glaze over is completely dry because if it's at all wet, you're going to end up, you're going to end up over like with hard edges, like what I was doing here, trying to alter my color. I ended up getting really hard edges next to the, um, sand and next to the, po the palm tree there. Uh, so you want to make sure that your paper is completely dry and you also will want to make sure that your paint doesn't have a lot of fillers. So like if I try to glaze with Cotman watercolors, which I really like Cotman, I teach with them. Um, I think for the price, they're, they're a good value. They're really difficult to glaze with because of the um, extenders and fillers that are in the paint. And a lot of student grade paint has these extenders because it brings the price down. So instead of being pure pigment, say like the cores, for instance, they have a lot of pigment, not a lot of binder or filler. Um, I can keep layering and layering and layering, but when you get a lot of extenders and fillers, then it it keeps the gum arabic or the aquasol, whatever your binder is, it keeps it from being super effective and, and sticking it down to the paper. So it dilutes the binder basically. So if you are using like a student grade paint, you just wanna make sure that you are using a really, really soft brush. Your paper is super, super dry. Your, your, your layer from before is really, really dry and that'll give you the best effects and just don't keep fussing with it. You've got to do it and leave it be because you will uh, you will lift it up with any aggravation if it's a student grade color. So hopefully um, between those different variables, you'll be able to figure out exactly what the, uh, what the issue with your glazing is. We can also go ahead and base in our, um, our surfboards here and our curtain. I'm gonna do the yellow first on my curtain. I think I'm gonna switch to a, a round brush. I don't want anything too small. Let's do a number four. And Indian yellow. You could also use a New Gamboge. You could use cadmium yellow. You just want kind of a warm yellow here. Nice and sunny and warm. And we're gonna, just gonna do stripes here. I know typically your, your rainbow starts with red, but um, I just thought that a yellow, yellow and blue striped um, curtain would be really cheerful. And I've had a lot of people comment about Aqua Bee paper, saying they're frustrated with it. Um, I do most of my practices on Aqua Bee, like before the live streams. And I think the issue with the Aqua Bee that people are having is that it is difficult to lift up on it. And so, but if you are somebody that likes to do glazing and you're having issues with your paint lifting up, um, a paper like Aqua Bee is not as heavily sized. So your paint's gonna sink into the fibers of the paper a little bit better and it will be easier for you to lift. So that's another thing that I just um, 
that just came to me about your glazing. Some papers are really heavily sized, like Kent's and Montville's really heavily sized, and your your paint wants to almost sit on top of the sizing and not um, get into the paper at all. So that will give you a little bit of a a little bit of an issue if you're trying to glaze on on a paper that's really really sized. Leah G, what kind of tape do you recommend to tape finished watercolors to the mat? Um, I use either like a rice paper tape or even like a, um, a surgical adhesive. I am mixing some, I'm going to see, I think this is Pyrrole Red. Let me just double check here. Yep, Pyrrole Red. Um, I just had a dab of it still on here, so I'm trying to use it up. I have that with the Indian yellow, so it's a warm yellow, warm red. They make a beautiful orange, and I'm going to do my first surf bar orange. Of course, you can do any color you want. And paint the whole thing. Paint right over those little markings on the bottom. Those are just little, um, like, non-skid, I think, foot, uh, foot steppy places, I guess. I don't surf. I'm not sure. These might not even be surfboards. These might actually be paddle boards. I they look like surfboards to me. Yeah, those paddle boards look so fun though. I keep seeing them, yes. people having them on the lakes around here. Let's see if, we get a, see if there's a place around here that rents them. I would imagine anywhere they rent kind of water stuff, you could probably. I have a feeling it's one of those things that looks really easy, but then when you go to stand on it, like. It's probably good core exercise because you have yeah, to stand on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lillian S., could you mix gum arabic into your paints and let them dry? Would that possibly help the glazing properties? I think it would hinder the glazing properties, even though it seems like it would um, it would give it more binding. It actually gum arabic also inclu increases the glossiness of it, um, and it keeps it from seeping into the paper as well. So it's going to stay on top of your paper more with more gum arabic and actually make it a little easier to lift. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I've got the alizarin crimson here. Basically, anything you're adding to your paint is going to make it more difficult to glaze. It's that pigment seep seeping into the paper and kind of getting locked there that makes it easy to glaze. Like, for instance, if I wanted to glaze any, like, any ultramarine blue, from any company, no matter how much you paid for it, no matter what company, that's going to be harder to glaze over than Thalo Blue, just because Ultramarine Blue uh, has, is, is granulating, it's got bigger pigment particles, and it's going to sit on top of the paper. It's not going to be sinking into the paper. That's It's a color that lifts off easily. Like I was mentioning with our sky, where you know if you're painting a sky with Ultramarine Blue, you can easily lift off those puffy clouds, and you can easily go back in later and scrub them away if you need to, whereas Thalo Blue, almost as soon as it hits the paper, it's going to be difficult to lift off. Like you have to, you know, you've got to lift off those clouds as soon as you put them in there and even so you're going to have some staining so you know different paints also have different qualities of staining or granulation and when you're buying um an artist grade paint usually on the tube or if you've you can't if you don't have the tube or the print's too small you can go to any um art supplier not amazon because they don't put that information but if you went to like jerry's artorama or blick you'd be able to look at the um each individual color generally and then see what the properties are like is it granulating does it have a g for granulating does it have an s for staining um, and that will give you some information about how well that's going to work for you i'm going to make some purple i'm going to take my crimson and um let's see i'm going to do crimson and ultramarine blue because that's going to lift a little easier if i want to lift out a highlight You can also make a violet with crimson and thalo blue. Thalo blue is such a transparent color, it mixes really well. Both of those blues make nice purples, but it's going to stain more if you use the thalo. Uh, paint and splashes, is pyro red more orange? Yes. It's a very warm red. Wendy Slowski, is cobalt blue easier to lift? It would be probably about the same as ultramarine. Ultramarine and cobalt have a very similar undertone. Like I rarely, ha I rarely use cobalt blue because um, it's weaker than ultramarine, and it gives me just about the same, um, the same quality. Cobalt might be a little bit more opaque. Most mineral colors are, and it's got a, a slight toxicity to it. 
and with cats that like to get into my drink my paint water if I'm not careful I try to I try to keep the, the toxic paint to a minimum I mean I think you'd have to ingest quite a bit of it but still Uh, Judith Taylor, which dries brighter, Mission Gold class or Core? Hmm. They're both awfully bright, bright paints. In fact, if you have one, you probably don't need the other. Um, gosh, they're both really bright. Um, I don't think there's a really discernible difference. All right. Now, because I used ultramarine blue in this violet, I'm getting a warmer, more whiny purple. If I used um, thalo blue, I would get a cooler violet. So just to, uh, just for your reference, so you can file that one away. And for the surfboard, I'm using a mix of my ultramarine and my thalo, so I get a nice kind of middle of the road. This is probably a little bit more thalo than ultramarine. I feel like we're the only people not getting hit with that crazy with those crazy snowstorms. It's <laughs> yeah. still March and May. I mean, yeah. it could happen. I know. I keep like it just feels like it's spring though, doesn't it? Feel, feel I feel for the people that are stuck in oh, it right man. now, but I'm also at the same time kind of happy that it's not coming here. Yeah. Well, you know, I was talking to uh, the spin doctor this morning, and they are getting hit like crazy yeah. over in England. And yes. they hardly ever get snow, yeah. you know? It's... The whole Paddy Picasso is in Ireland. They, he's the whole Scotland, England, Ireland. It's all getting slammed. Man. Uh, Judith Taylor, if they're both bright, which one do you like better? Oh, boy. Um, honestly, I like them both. I tend to use the core more often just because of the way I have it set up. I have them all in half pan so I can easily move them around and... and use them more conveniently and my mission gold um i put them in this awkward palette and i don't because of the palette they're in i don't use them that often i should probably try to pop them out and put them in a half pans or something because i'm not using them that much where they are and i find it hard to tell what the colors are because i have to look at my color chart because they're so vibrant although i do have the the perfect pan set and then again now that i think about that i use the the mission golds that are in my that, that came in pans a lot more than the ones I bought in tubes because they're more convenient. But as far as using them, I like them probably about the same. I would say go for whatever suits your budget and your needs, the colors, you know, that you have, um, that you have available to you. I'm going to go with that same color I did for the water for the most part and do this last surfboard here. I think once you're in the professional artist color range the differences are pretty small and it just comes down to personal preference and it's kind of like I don't paint with oils that much so you can give me you know you could give me 10 tubes of burnt sienna from different brands and I'm not really going to notice much of a difference between them you know unless there's a really bad quality but I'm not really going to notice that much of a difference I think it's almost like wine you have to be like almost immersed in it to notice the tiny details between the different brands find something you like and I mean and I'm not a very good example of this because I enjoy all of my watercolors sparked joy so I didn't get rid of any of them when I decluttered last year and I enjoy trying different ones out and you know seeing how they compare but it is certainly not necessary you find a set that you like and just just stick with it is unless you you know unless you like collecting watercolors like I do which is nothing wrong with that there's not huge differences. All right, now I'm going to work on this tree trunk over here. Actually, you know what? We could do our little umbrella while we have those colors out and fresh. Uh, paint some little stripes on your umbrella. If you did an umbrella. That's like a half circle. You don't have to get too fussy with it. And if you're careful, you can go, you'll leave like just a tiny little gap between the colors and you can do, you know, just paint them all in a row. 
I'm doing fairly dry paint on dry paper. This is far away, so it doesn't have to have a lot of detail. And if you get little slivers of white here and there, it's just going to look like reflections and highlights, and that works. Your umbrella could have little stripes of white in between the colors. I've seen them like that before. I've been really into rainbow stuff late, lately. I've got a uh, tutorial of um, a rainbow lollipop being painted on Sunday. Mm. Yeah, Jackson saw that. He goes, hey, do you have lollipops? <laughs> Mom? I'm like, yeah, out of my table. Go ahead. I actually had a couple because I, I didn't know which one I was going to paint because they were just a little bit different. So he he made use of my, he minimized my excess lollipops. That's good. <laughs> yeah. We went to Sam's Club and they had all these, uh, all the Valentine's candies oh, on, on clearance. clearance. And I almost bought, but I was good because, you know, I'm all minimalist now. Um, they had this set, it was like test tubes and they had bubble gum in them. And there were like 24 test tubes of bubble gum in them. And I bought one um, when the kids were younger. I had bought some for party favors mm -hmm. um, before Valentine's Day. And all of the tubes that were left over, I used to, sto to store beads. Um, and I actually still have some empty ones, but I almost bought, it was like three bucks for 24 test tubes and right, like, right, right. with and covers. Like, and all that candy. Yeah, it was, it was just bubble gum. And I mean, for that price, I could have dumped it out, but I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, away. I'm walking away. It was hard though. Cause old Lindsay would have been totally all over that. You would have bought four of them. <laughs> I would have, I totally would have. Cause like for future storage needs and for exactly. future parties that I might it's have. It's only $3. Yep. So it's not that big. I can just store it away. I'm, I'm feeling the need, though, to do another another purge. I don't know about craft stuff, but I'm definitely feeling the need to purge. Yeah, I'm getting that, too. I have I have a pile started. Well, because John, we need to go through a bunch of his clothes because he's got pants and shorts that are getting too big for him. Oh, yep. Yeah. And I was like, well, it's time. He has some time off this weekend. So I told him I'm making him go through his clothes. <laughs> he was not excited looking when I told him. <laughs> I told him, I was like, well, you can do it with me or I'll do it myself. Yep. And you'll just come home and everything will be cleaned out. And the terror. And the <laughs> That's why he's cooperating. I need to get rid of my aspirational jeans. It's like, I'm just going to put them in a bo box and I think I will keep them, you know, because I know as soon, as soon as I, you know, get rid of them, right. I'll be able to fit into them. But it's like, yeah, I got to get rid of the aspirational clutter. I got rid of the, I had like, French speaking software. I got rid of that, like, last year. It's like, yep, I apparently am never going to speak French. That ship has sailed. It sailed. It sailed when I was in high school, I think. Right. <laughs> and that's okay, you know. You only have so much time in the day. All right, so now I'm going to grab some, I'm going to back to that flat brush, even though it was a little cheapy, it off, works awfully well. Um, I'm going to add some water into this kind of gray mix. This is ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. We want it nice and watery. We're going to what kind of whitewash our, not whitewash, I guess gray wash our fence and our little hut there. Let's do the hut first. So we got a nice uh, a neutral gray color here. Remember, it's going to dry lighter. When you have a, a lot of water in your paint, it dries lighter, way lighter. The more water, the more of a shift you'll get when it dries. I'm kind of staining. Think of it like you're staining that wood. Cause 
Sandra Gilbert, how do you avoid harsh edges in watercolor? Uh, you gotta just basically uh, make sure that if you want an area to be blendy, that you wet it all. You keep the the, the uh, wetness of the paper consistent when you're working. You get the hard edges when something starts to dry. Like I've got a really bad hard edge here because the water was starting to dry while I was trying to blend it um, because I didn't wet the area first because I thought, oh, that's small enough space. I can I can get in and out of there before anything starts to dry. So keeping a in uniform uh, dampness to the paper will help. For the fence, I want it a little bit browner, so I'm just taking a little bit of burnt sienna and adding it into that mix I was just using. And I'm gonna start at this end of the fence and work that way so it gives it a, gives that uh, hut a chance to dry. Don't worry if this isn't super blended because these are just like, um, it's kind of a bunch of boards. So it would be fine if some were more weathered and some were darker and lighter. Don't make it too perfect or too blendy. I'm curious to know what the folks in chat think about the chat on these on the live streams on YouTube being available afterwards. I wonder if it's a uh, if they think it's a good thing or or not. Uh, Shelly Louise, I'm a newbie into art journaling and get my inspiration from YouTube videos. I notice that when it comes to watercolor sets, most use Jane Davenport. Are they good for beginners? Um, they're really fun. I would say the get the brights and the neutrals. Between the two of them, they're a good. That's a good palette. The sea glitz is very specialized. And I think that really with the brights and the neutrals, you'd be able to mix anything that was in the sea glitz, except there's a couple slightly metallic ones. Um, but for your regular watercolor painting, I don't think they would be that advantageous. They're very similar in quality to um, like the Prima watercolor conf confections. And they're easy to find because uh, Michael's stores carries them if you have a Michael's near you. And of course you can use a coupon on it, making it pretty reasonable. I think the regular price on them is $24, so uh, maybe it's $29. It's in that ballpark, so it can be quite affordable with a coupon. I'm going to put some, um, just some kind of barky texture on this uh, tree trunk over here as well. I'm just kind of wiggling my brush. I'm using the, I'm kind of pressing my brush so that it's going flat against the paper like that, like my fingers the paper, and I'm letting the paint kind of skip on the texture of the paper for a little bit of texture too. Uh, let's see, we have some people who are glad that the chat archives will be good. Okay. So. Yeah, I might go look, and if I see people like talking like, maybe right. not, not aware that it's gonna be archived, I might remove right. it just because I don't want anybody's privacy. I'm sure anybody posting something in a public space would, you know, is probably pretty mindful of that, but you just, I know people make good friendships out there. I don't want anyone to right. feel vulnerable that something's out there that that they don't want. I don't think any past ones are out there. I think this is all going forward. Well, and we've had several people say that normally they don't get a chance to catch, but due mm -hmm. to weather, they're here. So they like right. the, idea of the chat being available later so that they can see, you know, when our moderators mm -hmm. answer questions, they can see that. Well, I have a, I'm in a YouTube group with like Melody Lane and Cinnamon Cooney and, and we're, Melody posted that last night. And I mean, we're excited because we usually can't see the chat because right. we're, you know, live streaming. We right. don't get to see what people are saying. So we were like super excited. Then it just, then it occurred to me, it's like, oh, I hope that, we're just going to make sure people know that it's, you know, that it'll be archived, I think. I'm taking um, burnt sienna, a little Naples yellow and a smidgen of ultramarine. And I'm just gonna kind of add some shadows here into the uh, into the kind of little beachy path here, going to the changing room. This only needs a few little swipes. And I also want to put a little bit of a shadow right next to the fence and to the um, uh, to the right of each of those surfboards because the light's kind of coming in from this direction, coming in from the left. 
So I want to make sure I kind of keep that in mind so that I'll have a consistent, uh, some consistent shadows happening. I do want to have a little, like I want the boards to kind of be stuck in the sand a little bit. So I do need to have a little bit of shadow on the right behind a little bit of sand that they're stuck into, but not as much as I have on the left. And I'm just blending it with a damp brush here. And I'm grabbing some Naples yellow. And if I have an area that's that I have like no color on, some it's okay sometimes, but if I like right up next to that surfboard, there really ought to be some color there. So I'm just kind of filling in spots that I missed. And speaking of spots that I missed, I'm neglecting that little palm tree back there. So we'll do a little bit of uh just a little bit of detail on the trunk. I'll be glazing over each of these trunks. I'm just getting the kind of some shadows in right now. Okay, now let's work on the palm tree from, oh, you know what, before we do that and we, well, we have our bright colors out, let's do little beach blankets over here. Maybe I'll do a red one and a blue one. I'll make that little, I'll make the little shovel red. Barely can see it, but it's uh, kind of neat. I'll do a little blue towel here. You could actually paint your towels to look like beach towels that you actually have. And after that's dry, I'll do the pale yellow probably. All right, and let's see, what do I want? I think I'm gonna use a juicy round brush to do the, to start off with the palm fronds anyway. Um, I'm gonna start with some sap green. I'm gonna see how that looks just on its own. Get some of the, some of the main um, stems of the leaves and then just kind of throw down some of the fronds, they, they hang down from that main spine in the back. So um, on this big one, especially, and you wanna leave gaps cause we'll go in with lighter and we'll go in with darker colors. So it's gonna look a little, you know, little elementary school here for a minute, but just stay with me. I had a question about, and I think I did address it in one of these uh, live streams about mixed greens. Um, somebody had commented, why don't you mix your greens? And um, the reason I do mix greens sometimes, we'll make, we will make be making a green with a phthalo blue and the Indian yellow. But um, a lot of times I do mix greens, but I start with a single pigment green, like a, like a phthalo green. Um, and then I'll mix orange in it or a yellow or a blue to, um, augment it to make it exactly what I want because when you have a single pigment versus a mixed pigment, you have greater vibrancy. So like a PG-7 or a PG-36, they're super crazy vibrant. So, you know, you're already starting off with a super bright color. And then when you when you add a color down to enhance it, you just get a vibrancy you're, you wouldn't necessarily get from mixing it with, you know, a two, a two pigment color, like a red and like a yellow and a blue, for instance. You know, this here, I'm gonna, I think I need to put something hanging down in front. And then I'm gonna grab my dark color, um, ultramarine and burnt sienna and get that kind of um, area right here underneath all the fronds. And I'm gonna do that wet. I'm just gonna paint that in there and let it flow together if it wants to. And I can throw a few little accents of that up here where we've got shadows where the leaves are kind of close together. I like it when bits of color flow together. It's just a nice contrast from like really crisp lines. And now we can do a bit of mixed green. So we'll start off with our Indian yellow. And we will add some phthalo blue to that. That's it. actually, that came out nice and vibrant. I think I'm gonna add, we'll do a little bit with that and then we can dull it down a little bit if we need to. Give us some nice little accents. 
Mostly I love how they blend together when we have the wet into wet interaction. I'm going to grab a little bit more Indian yellow for that. And I think I'll go ahead and throw in some of the palm fronds back here with that color because it's nice and bright. If you want to switch to a dagger or a liner, you can. I just wouldn't mix up with those colors, like mix the paint themselves because um, those are pretty floppy brushes and it can be a little, little hard on them. I'm gonna grab a little more sap green, a little sap green to add into this one. I think I will grab a liner though. That will add a a different line character to it. So I'm just going to get that area at the top of the tree here that's just kind of fuller. Add a little brown and blue into that as well. And if you want to get out the credit card scraper, you could scrape some details. And even drag down some of the palm fronds. Almost like a pen, like you're using a dip pen. And you're dipping into ink, except you're just scraping out the puddles here. That little uh, line back there is a little too distinct. I need to put some little fronds off of it. I'm going to make them spike up just so I don't create a big blob. And I think I'm just going to go ahead with some burnt sienna and just glaze down the edge of that tree. Yeah, I think that one's pretty much done. I do see a stray pencil line, so maybe I'll make another little palm frond there. Now on this one, I put a couple coconuts in there, so let's paint those first. Uh, let's do a little bit of Naples yellow on each one. And then we can grab a little of the sap green on the opposite side. Kind of outline it a bit. Then we can take some watered down, burnt sienna, kind of make those colors meet in the middle. And then we get a nice kind of shaded, real coconut look. I love the smell of coconut, but I do not like the texture of it. I don't like coconut water. Have you ever had coconut water? No. That's gross. I don't no. recommend it. <laughs> the only time I like coconut is in baked goods. Like the shredded stuff? Yeah. Ugh. You toast it, and you put it in something, and it's delicious. Hmm. I just drink plain water. Just, yeah. Because I, I get it for my tap for free. Seriously. I know. I like. I, I refuse to buy water. I always either bring it with me or it's like, I'll buy a Diet Coke just to see. I'm like, I'm not paying for water. I'll get a Diet Coke. <laughs> uh, take a little burnt sienna. And I'm just going to glaze over this trunk here and so we should be able to see those markings that we put on there earlier pretty watery wash here 
and make sure you keep this pretty wet and that you have your credit card scraper handy because we are going to scrape in some texture. I'm totally winging this palm tree because I, I just sketched it from my mind. There was really no trunk references, but I've seen enough palm trees. I think I can, I can cope. Or somebody from a tropical land is like, that does not look like a palm tree. And then if you scrape, um, and it's just starting to get, get like dry out when you scrape, you can scrape away some of the color and then you end up with another tone, which can look kind of cool. Cassandra Gilbert, have you heard our tried artist spectrum watercolors? Art spectrum. Artist spectrum. No, I haven't. The name rings a bell, though. I, you know what? Maybe I have. I think they're, um, it was probably a long time ago. So if I recall, they're kind of like about, about the same as Reeves. I think, but geez, you know, I don't dare to, to make a definitive comment on that because Someone if, else in chat may have tried it, and they can... Oh, good. Yeah, I hope so. If anyone else has tried it... We have over 300 people watching. Oh, somebody, sweet. Somebody may have tried it. All right, those are getting a little dark, I think. I'm going to leave that be for a bit and glaze over that trunk with some burnt sienna. And while that's wet, I'm actually going to make a darker mix and add that to the left-hand side because that has a strong shadow on it. And do some scraping. And make sure your lines are perfectly straight. They should have a little bit of a curve to it because we are on a cylinder. Tree trunk is cylindrical. And we can go ahead and do some palm fronds on the top of this tree. We'll start off again with, let's do, um, let's do our sap green with a little bit of Indian yellow to start off with because this is closer to us. It'd probably be a little bit brighter. And you can, you can really be expressive with these. And I saved this one for last because um, uh, you want to kind of get a little practice in before you do the thing that's closest because that's what's going to be largest and what's going to stand out. And you don't want to make those lines look real fussy. I'll go right off the top of the paper with that too. Sap green on its own so it will stand out. If I have a small frond, I am going to put the uh, leaves on both sides. It's when they get really big and heavy and they're kind of like hanging over the tree. You, they kind of fall straight down. When they're smaller, you can see them kind of branch out from either side. And I'm using that number eight round. I'm just working on the tip of that brush. So like I said earlier, if you get a good good quality brush, treat it well. It'll last you a long time and you'll be able to, you know, get the full full gamut of the brush. You'll get the thick, the thickness of the belly of the brush. You'll be able to do thick lines and you'll get the fine little point from using the tip of the brush. But you gotta take care of your brush. Don't use it for oil painting or acrylic painting. Keep it just for watercolors. You don't need a lot of brushes. You just need a couple really good ones. If you use rougher paper, you will go through your brushes more frequently. So just kind of see if it's, you know, if you're going to use rough paper, just maybe not use your pointiest brushes because you're not really going to get that kind of detail with it anyway because of the, the hills and the valleys in the paper. Make sure you bring your color right off the edge of that painting. It's going to give it a little bit of a frame. It's going to give you some scale. You've got this big tree in front. And 
And I'm going to mix a little bit of the um, phthalo blue into this mix. And I'm going to grab a little burnt sienna. Darken it a little bit. And I can put a few fronds in with that. I can add some shadows around the coconuts. If I add some shadow up here, it's just going to make it appear as if it's like more dense. And you can do some scraping for fine details. Some papers aren't going to handle the scraping that well, so just kind of keep that in mind. If you feel like it's tearing your paper up, then don't do it. Arches does really well with the scraping, but other some some papers don't. And I'm going to use a liner brush to do some kind of some thinner fronds here, just on a few of the um, a few of them, just so that we've got a little bit of detail. Because this is the closest one, we want to make sure we do have some real crisp lines. Not a lot of questions today, unless the moderators are getting them all. Moderators are helping a lot, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Now we can hop back over to the surfboards, and actually we can do our shadows on the umbrella and the surfboards at the same time. And it's basically, it's a glazing technique. We're going to, um, um, oh, I forgot to also put our blue stripes. Let's do our blue stripes on the in our, um, I guess you could keep it white and yellow stripe too if you wanted to. That looks pretty. I didn't notice it was missing anything until just now. So I guess if you want to just keep it white, you can. I think a liner is not the best brush for that though, because it wants to wants to bend too much, hard to control. It's a good idea to not clean your palette off until you're done a particular painting. And then it's a good idea to clean your palette off so you don't get confused with your mixes the next time you do a painting. There, and I like have a little bit of white slivers here and there to make it look like it's highlighted. So for a shadow on our yellow, we can do yellow and pick up a little bit of that grayish color that we made, or you can pick up a little bit of violet and that will just darken it up, gray it down enough so you get a shadow. And I'm gonna do that on this part of the, the umbrella that's hanging down. I'm gonna do some of that. I'm gonna add a little red to it so it's more orangey. And I'm going to add that uh, to the tip of the surfboard because the they kind of bend forward, so they're getting a little shadow there. And also down the um, the right right hand side here. And at the bottom a little bit. For the red, we can just take our crimson. We can just grab a little bit of that purple. That'll be that'll dull it down and darken it up enough. And again, we'll do it on the tip where the board bends. And you can go right down the side here. Enough water on your brush to make it move though. And even with student grade colors, you shouldn't have a problem with glazing like this. This isn't like I'm using a soft brush. It's not really aggressive. Um, you should be able to handle glazing. Now, sometimes another thing I thought of about the glazing issue um, with student grade colors is sometimes they're, they tend to be a little more opaque because of the fillers. Um, so you could glaze and it's not going to look like you glazed because there's there's too many additives. Oops, I got some grime in that paint. I'm going to remix some purple. I'm making a nice dark color. So it's purple, but more blue than red. Same two colors, alizarin crimson and ultramarine. That's what I had used for this one. 
and same technique. So when you have opaque colors, they don't tend to glaze because they look the same because they're opaque. So when you layer an opaque color over another opaque color, that second color blocks. It doesn't let the light go through and that's what you need with glazing. You need a transparent color. And we'll do the same thing with the blue. And that was both of our blues that we used there. We just need to make it a little bit more concentrated, I think, for this, because it's fairly light. Can add a smidgen of your orangey red in there. If it feels too light, that'll gray it down. Carol, actually, what is the difference between a painting and an illustration? Um, it, well, they, uh, an illustration can be a painting. An illustration usually is the purpose behind the, the picture. An illustration generally is made for a commercial purpose, like, um, like a storybook or an advertisement or um, uh, something like that, a magazine, where a painting usually has more of um, like a fine art purpose. But I mean, this, that's that's the real big difference. Uh, sometimes paintings can look more illustrative, like if it looks like an animation or, um, you know, just has more of that kind of illustrative quality. Like the work of Norman, Norman Rockwell, he did paintings, but you'd probably consider them more, you'd consider those illustrations because they were illustrations for the Saturday, um, the Saturday Evening Post, I think. That was yes. the name of that, right? Um, even though there, there were paintings, but there were also illustrations. You, and also, often an illustration is more, tells a story. It's more communi communi like very overtly communicating, communicative, uh, whereas a painting can just be lovely to look at, or it may have more of a um, subdued meaning. An illustration is usually very, it's very obvious what, the, what it's trying to say. It's meant to communicate. In a, in a way that most people could understand. That's a great question though. Yeah. Never thought about that before. Because sometimes I might call a, pa uh, a painting of mine an illustration if it, if it feels very much like it's telling a very particular... Well, because when you did the book... Right. You did painting. Right. But they were technically illustrations. Right. Because they were going along... They were helping to tell a story. Mm-hmm. And often if you're illustrating, you're telling somebody else's story too, as opposed to a painting where you might be telling your own story. This story is, I like the beach. I miss the beach. I'd like to be at the beach. I think we all would like to be at the beach. <laughs> Those of us that aren't at the beach, we would all like to be at the beach. Yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Let's do a little, come to think of it, I don't know if those little, those little hangy do's off the umbrella really need shading because they're pretty far away, but you know, you can do that. You can repeat any of those colors down on your umbrella if you want to, with the parts that are hanging down. It does give it a little dimension. I mean, truthfully, all you need is a really just a dab because it's hardly, it's so far away. All right, so now if you have a little scrubber brush, not that like really aggressive one that I told you to stay away from unless you were spattering, but like um, my favorite little Maxine's mop. I did not link that up, but it's called a Maxine's mop if you're looking for it. This is the quarter inch size and it's a little filbert and it's per the best watercolor scrubber. Even though um, it's technically like sold for acrylic painters, it is like the best watercolor scrubber I've ever used. And you should be able to find that um, either on Amazon or any place that sells toll painting supplies because it is more of a decorative artist tool. And I'm going to go down the side of this um, and I'll link it up after the live stream in case yeah, in case you can't find it. Now. Yeah, I'll link it up afterwards. I don't have it currently linked up because I didn't think of it. Um, I'm going and adding a highlight here. 
Now, if you have a paper that just won't lift, you, you know you're gonna shred it if you do this, that's fine. What you wanna do is use your colored pencils. Use, um, you can use a white or a pastel version of the color you have here. If you use white, you're probably gonna have to overlay another color, but you can totally get the look. So don't wreck your paper just to keep it, <coughs> bless you, just because you want it to be a, a traditional watercolor. <coughs> Goodness, I was sneezing like crazy earlier today. Gazoom tight. Um, you know, use it, just use another medium that's going to work, that's going to give you the result you want. And if you have a color that just stained too much and you can't lift it up, that's, you know, grab that color pencil. I found since I've put my color pencils next to my, um, next to my desk, it's so easy to grab them. I use them a lot more often now. So anytime you've got a supply that you're just feeling bad, that you haven't used it, make it easy and convenient for yourself. If, if you, you know, you wish you were doing art after work, but you know, at night after supper and you're sitting down by the TV, watching TV or scrolling through your smartphone, may, put a basket of art supplies next to your TV, next to your couch so you, you'll pick it up and you will grab it. Okay, now we're gonna go back to the number two round, or you can use a liner, whatever you like. I wanna put some little tufts of grass here and there, um, cause they like to poke through the sand sometimes. And I'm gonna throw some near this palm tree. It's also gonna help give it a little bit of a, kind of sink it into the ground a little bit better. And that's where you generally would have grasses. You know, they kind of grow up next to something where they're protected. Up next to a fence. Some place you're not getting stepped all over. And that helps bring a, a little more life into the scene as well. And we're almost done. Nice thing about this one is there's so many different areas you can play and work around that you don't, you know, have to spend a lot of time drawing or leaving it be. You can give your eyes a break on the surfboards while you work on the palm trees. You can give your eyes a break on the um, on the sky while you work on the the sand. So you can constantly be working on something. I feel like I need a little bit more shadow here and there in the sand. So I'm using, I'm still using that small brush and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm afraid that um, I could go a little overboard. So if I just have a little brush, it only holds a little bit of paint. I can't get too much down. If I see that I'm on the wrong track, I can, correct before I've made too big of a mistake. So as I progress in a painting, I often will switch to smaller brushes just so I don't get overboard if I, um, if I do something that I regret. Now I do need some shadow from that palm tree, that palm tree right there, that's gonna be casting a fairly significant shadow. So I've got burnt sienna and ultramarine blue here. I want a fairly neutral gray. And I am going to have a shadow that's on the ground. I need a lot more water with that. In fact, I will go to a bigger brush just because I, I don't want to have little tiny strokes for that. So that shadow is going to be going over near the cabana here. I'm going to soften it and add a little elsewhere so it doesn't seem completely out of place. And I'm also going to be adding some shadow onto the onto this little cabana or changing room. And that's that same gray. I'm just not using a ton, just kind of dappling it on there. I'll mix up a little bit more. Remember, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna. And have a rag handy if you get too much on there. And I'm gonna put a little bit of shadow in on the fence behind each of the surfboards to the right of them to help 
give them a little bit of uh, a little bit of char uh, character. Just give them a little bit of depth. I give give the fence a little bit of space between them and the surfboards. You can have the shadow a little bit wider at the bottom. And let it diffuse out a little bit. And this tree, I think I'm going to add a little bit of that shadow color to the left hand side of this tree too. And just kind of dab on some marks just to help make it look a little bit more pronounced. I think I might put some Naples yellow into the bark as well because it'll help it stand out because it is more of an opaque color. I'm going to take that, mix it into that grayish color that I made to tone it down. Maybe add a little smidgen of a smidgen of that uh, pyrrole red. So it was a little too green. And we'll see how that looks as soon as it dries. That color might be nice in our little path too. And I think that that is, oh, one last detail we have to put is on the uh, surfboards. We have the little areas for people to stand, the non-skid area. Um, Brent Sienna and Ultramarine Blue, we're gonna make a, it's kind of like a grayed, gray dull neutral color and you can go ahead and just put those just paint those in uh Aaron mist because you haven't taped off a margin are you planning to on floating it in the frame so you don't lose some elements around the edges if so how do you float it um no I would I would put a mat I would just try to cover up as little as possible. Or the other thing I do with watercolors is I will mount them on a piece of mat board. Um, like I might mount this on white mat board or I might mount it on like uh, like an ecru color and then I would cut a mat that's like um, a quarter of an inch larger than the picture so that the whole picture can be seen if I like the way the edges look. I still generally plan to like mat stuff I've done on blocks with a traditional picture frame mat though. If I have torn edges, I like to, um, I like to do the technique where you glue it to like a piece of mat board and then you cut a bigger mat around it so that you have those edges exposed because I think that looks really pretty. And to any place you feel like you just need a little more shadow, you can go and dab that in. Just try to be really, just really soft with it so you don't have a bunch that you have to blend in and fix just to kind of, just kind of alter here and there. Under the eave here, we could do a little bit of, a little more shadow under that. Just kind of drag it down. And I think that pretty much does it. What do you think, Sarah? Has that looked done to you? I think so. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone who hung out today, especially after a week off. I know it can be hard to remember to come back. I um, hope everybody stays warm and safe. And let if you're, if you're getting really cold weather and you're not used to it um, in the part of the country you're at, let your water, like, turn your water on a little bit so it drips so you don't freeze your pipes. Because I know around here most house fires are started because somebody's trying to thaw their pipes out and just by turning your your faucet on letting it drip that will um that'll keep your pipes from freezing so just thought i'd put that out there if there's anybody in really getting really cold weather that they're not accustomed to any more questions before we go we're all caught up awesome well thank you guys so much for watching please give me a thumbs up before you leave and if you had a question and we can get a chance to answer it you can leave it in the comments after the live stream Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.